All right, thank you for coming out to pray with us tonight. Wonderful turnout, actually. So, I have no idea where we're going with this. Okay. I just know what I'm going to share, but I have no idea where we're going with this. I had a phrase this morning I felt God gave me, which I prayed in the 8 o'clock meeting, that God would mess us up. That he would just undo us. There are too many respectable Christians in the church today. This morning I spoke about how to lose, how to empty your church and lose friends, remember? And sometimes I know, I mean, I was preaching at this other church, helping them make certain adjustments, Thursday night, Friday night, and then hence and I spent two hours with the eldership team yesterday. And the guy said to me, sure, you, the one elder's wife said, you are very direct, you're very straight with us, you're very, she carries on a bit. And so I said to her, so I said to her, no, you've got to understand, I didn't know you or your people, I was, I was considerate. She took a breath back and she, remember, she says, if that's you, consider it. I don't ever want to be on the other side. Anyway, so whatever. So the point is this. I think we skirt around too much stuff that people need to help set them free. And we are honestly wanting to be undone by the presence of God. And it's a road that many of us, if not most of us, haven't gone down. Because it's great to have good worship, which it is, semi-decent preaching, good fellowship, whatever. But the answer to our city is if we're undone by the presence of God. That's what will that, make a difference. And it is true that maybe I do put certain standards up that I think we should live by. I mean, I cannot understand people who choose to come to either a morning or an evening meeting and you're serious with God. I haven't done that in 27 years of being saved. I come both because it's obvious. It's obvious. But to some people it isn't. I am choosing comfort over. Well, good for you. Go hop around on your one leg forever. You see, Sunday mornings I talk about how to live as a Christian. I'm dealing with it. This morning, I, people, were cry, people come to me after saying I was crying in the service. I didn't know why. I thought I preached all right. They didn't, obviously. I'm thinking, sheesh, I better improve my little preach. But in the evenings, I want to talk and I want us to pray into what it means to conduct our lives in Him as a spiritual people. There are no shortcuts to a depth of relationship with the Lord. And so last week, I mean, my phrase is that abiding in Him. That's kind of where I'm going. And last week, I gave you two scriptures. The one was Mark 11. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle, humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I covered that last Sunday night. There will be people who listened to it, who were there, said, Yarn, Amen, and tonight are as burdened as they were last week. But they've had seven days to begin to learn what it means to take his yoke upon them. You see, a preach doesn't change you. Hearing truth doesn't change you. It's what you do with it. I sat with a businessman this week who's got some major adjustments to make, and I saw some guys praying for God's side actually now, wanting to do all sorts of things. And I wanted to say them, but I was too polite. But I did say to the businessman this week, he's giving me all these hassles in life. And I said to him, you know what? 21 years of leading a church, I know this one thing. I have never, ever seen someone change who doesn't want to. Never seen it. And you can come with your snotty tears and come and sit with us and say, oh, pray for me, pray for me. I told you last Sunday, too many of us have VD, verbal diarrhea. We talk too much. We are flippin' excellent at talking. And Ecclesiastes 5 says, let your words be few. It's better to listen than to yuck the whole time. Why? Because in listening, you receive. There's no shortcut to this stuff. Then, I gave John 15 about remain in me, I will remain in you. Uh, no branch can bear fruit by itself, must remain in the vine. You can't you know, bear fruit unless you remain in me, etc., etc. That was John chapter 15, and I gave a whole lot of stuff on that. And I spoke about when you're born again, Jesus says, come to me. And if you, if you are kind of thinking, I don't remember, or I wasn't here last week, we have a YouTube channel now. Designated YouTube channel belongs to New Day. New Day Church ZA. Get on there, the sermons are there, click and listen, it's all free. Second thing I said was, 
Jesus commands or asks us to come to him. Today, I want to talk about two things. We're going to pray and we're going to minister. Same as tomorrow night. Half past six till half past seven, we're going to minister. The one thing I want to say tonight is Jesus, when you come to him, when you abide in him, he becomes the burden bearer. That's why he says, come to me, you are weary, you are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Why? Because he bears our burdens. You see, his burden is light. His yoke is easy, but it's still a burden and it's still a yoke. Are you okay? You see, there's still something of a burden that Jesus places on you. Paul talks about daily carrying about in his heart the pressure, the agonizing of his concern for the churches. I said this to Hamilton, I said it to Ed, I've said it to Yanis, and I'll say it to every guy who takes over or plants or whatever a church out of New Day, I'll say this. From the day you put your hand up and say, Lord, I will carry this church and hands get laid on you, you will never have a 24-hour period again in your life where you don't think about that church, where you don't carry it and things happen in your spirit. And so it is with any call God gives you. Any of you in this room carrying something that you know God gave you, has there ever been a 24 hours where that thing's not pulsating inside you? That's the burden. Every single mom knows what I'm talking about. Your burden was your kid. Your little sprog, out it comes. And you don't stop thinking about that thing again. Isn't it? My mother's in her 60s. She lives in another province. And when she does find me, she's like, remember now, drive safely. I think, well, for the last three weeks, when you didn't speak to me, I'm still alive. Praise God, I did drive safely. Now get out of my face. And Jesus wants to put a burden on us from his kingdom. The problem is our own sinfulness is always there to give us a hard time. There are other illegitimate burdens that the flesh, the devil, the enemy, and ourselves want to give us all the time. There are Christians burdened with stuff that God never gave them. They don't know how to let it go. They don't know how to shake it off. And as Christians, and we all do it, we consciously make decisions to get into situations that's going to get us in trouble. Don't we? And I'll tell you what's happening almost 100% of the time is we're swapping his burden for our own. Because God made you and God made me for more. And if we do not embrace the more in him, something in us craves more. So we get involved in stuff. Hobbies, habits, sports, little things that swallow time that were given for the sake of the kingdom of God. And then we justify why we do what we do. Number four, and we're going to talk about it when we pray. Jesus, not only is the burden bearer, he identifies with people's needs and he can help them. If I was not convinced that Jesus can help people, let's just close up shop now. Let's all go to another church, me included. Because I can't lead something unless I'm convinced that it works. I don't have that kind of personality. I mean, I couldn't go sell a washing machine that I know is going to break in three months. Do you know what I'm saying? I could never do it. I'm going to go sell the best one that costs the most money with a guarantee this thing will go 20 years. That I can do. Because we're people of conviction. And in 21 years, I have seen God do the most incredible things in people's lives. I've seen him totally mess people up who want to be messed up. I've also seen so-called Christians who refuse to change who've never changed. Because there's one thing you and I have that's extremely powerful. It's our stubbornness. Oh, we're good at it. Hey? Jesus helps us in our needs. I had a whole lot of scriptures I wanted to give you, but I'm not going to. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 7, Hebrews 9. A whole lot of scriptures. What I wanted to say is this. We are safe when we come to Jesus. People are safe. We hand out visitors cards and there's three, four, five, six visitors per, I'll say per episode, per meeting. I'm telling you, we need 50 plus visitors per meeting because you are convinced that those people will be safe when they come to Jesus. Do you know how many times people come and respond to an altar call here, and then we say, so many people got saved. If you hear my language, I say, so many people responded. 
to a message because I have no idea at what level their flesh got touched because of change and at what level the regenerating work of the Spirit got in there. Because when the Spirit regenerates you, you don't need anyone to come and kick your backside to get you running for Jesus. You will do it because of the Spirit of God inside you. Otherwise, you're floating this way and that way and this way and that way. And you may have, you can be a person who has a number of emotional encounters with Jesus and remain unchanged. 5,000 people got fed by him. 4,000 got fed by him. Many got healed by him, touched by him. His band of those who were devoted to him never got bigger than around 120. But he touched thousands more. People are safe when they come to Jesus. He forgives. I wonder how many of you sitting right here have committed stuff you thought, God in heaven, you can never forgive me. And then he did. And you knew he had. There's nothing more freeing. There'd been a person here who the vilest thing held against you. Jesus says, I've forgotten. He helps us. He carries us. He becomes the one we come to. Can I also tell you this though? Jesus helps us through each other. And that's where I want to go with this. Jesus helps us through each other. Many new believers stay immature because they never progress past being saved by grace. They get saved by grace and they linger there from that day onwards. They know they're going to heaven. They know their sin is forgiven. They know their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's it. And they always talk about that. And when those kind of songs come on with the worship, tears, hands up. But when it's other stuff, Nations are waiting. They go, oh, oh, oh. And then we have, we have a little bit of communion. <laughs> because they're stuck there. They've never moved past this place. Just don't know what it means. Oh, brother, Jesus wants to forgive you. Say, so, yes, he does. He does. But that's where life starts, not ends. Have you watched those movies? And as I was a kid, they, they, they go off into the sunset happily ever after. Check that. Have you ever, any of you ever remember that? I realized I'm a lousy lover. I'm not a good one. I kiss hands here, there's never music. <laughs> Except once, remember, I put in the old house. I went and put some classical on. Then I kissed her and she goes, what's that noise? <laughs> oh, I went and turned it off, came back, remember, in primrose. I, I felt so like I said, oh, Wally. Because where's the music? Why when you get married, they say, you know, they, they fight, they have hassles. Nothing works. Nothing. Then they kiss and make up. And the music and the credits start and it's all good. If you've dealt with marriages for longer than an hour, you know they are in, they're in it up to here. That's why you need episode 2 through 58. Because it's going to, you just don't know. Hey? It's a royal stuff up on the way. You see, some of us think that we get the happy hebes and now, whoa, God bless you, I'm forgiven. And you are, but you've only just begun. Every single one of the disciples that Jesus called to himself, every one he put to work. On his terms. But today, we're full of Christians with bad attitudes who want to serve God on their terms, if at all. And the moment you tell them, boys and girls, there's some work to be done. I'm a grace person. Listen, you retard. You can't even spell grace. Because Paul says, by God's grace, I worked harder than all of the so-called apostles. When he died, he said, there's nowhere left for me to go and preach. His grace was effectual working in me. It's grace. You want grace, you're unstoppable. You're not an excuse of a Christian who justifies their living together and stuffing around under the words of grace, brother. Foot sack. <laughs> You've never understood grace. Okay, I, I'm horrible. I'm sorry, maybe I am. I calm, okay, I'll calm down. I'm telling you, 
mark my words. I hope I pray to God I'm not one of them. I ever I want him to sort me out. There are preachers who will get into heaven because they believe in Jesus. But they're going to escape through flames to get there. On this basis. They spend their lives letting their congregations off the hook. Just listen to what's being preached out there. Just listen. Bro, God just loves you as you are. He just loves you as you are. What a load of rubbish. He doesn't just love you as you are. He loves you enough to turn you into the image of his son Jesus that his fellowship with you can be complete, 1 John. You cannot, in broken fallenness, enjoy the fullness of a relationship with God. It's like you, if you're a single person here today, do you know what? I'm going to go and marry the biggest reject on this planet. The biggest emotional stuff up that ever lived. I'm going to go and marry them. And when the pastor says, oh, please put it together, kiss it. Why well, declared you one? Now suddenly you look at each other and have this great relationship. My friend, you are going into the house of horrors. And can I tell you, that's why marriages get better over time when both are willing to change. Because you become more like Christ over time. Are you hearing me? Many stay immature because they don't progress past being saved by grace. God's highest purpose for the cross was indeed firstly that we would be forgiven of our sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But equally attached to it, he invites us back into intimate family relationship with himself. He didn't save us to forgive us. He forgave us that we may be one with him again. You see, in the garden before the fall, it says they walked with him. God doesn't want to save someone who goes Prancing up the hills are alive. Where that stuff's happening, but there's no intimacy with him. Living on what he did for you, not on who he is to you. And you can spend five minutes with someone and know whether they walk with him or they don't. Five minutes. There is a fragrance that comes from us. As we spend time with him. Are you okay? John 1 verse 12 says. But to all who did receive him. Who believed in his name. He gave the right. To become children of God. Who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man. But born of God. I'm going to open that up now. It's this relationship with God as his sons and daughters that then gives us an inheritance. Nick read actually for the offering, Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba. Father, David's taken to that now, and I take him to school in the morning because he's adopted. You know, he, he, father, it's his new thing now. The last few days, hello, father. I'm telling about the spirit of adoption. Father, the spirit himself. Listen, the spirit himself bears witness within our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. These texts indicate that when we become children of God, do you notice the words there? It says, he gave us the right, listen, to become children of God. And that's what I want us to pray through in a moment. We all need to engage the becoming process. Some of us think I've arrived, but I'm telling you we need to become there is still a becoming, a transforming that needs to happen. And because God never lets us off the hook like most pastors do, there are two ways we can measure 
how much we're becoming like Jesus. Two ways. Number one, in who we're becoming in our likeness to him in our character. Galatians 5.22, right? The fruit of the Spirit. So when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, have I left any out? There's eight of them, I think, or nine. When you go through the fruit of the Spirit, it simply describes Jesus. It's the fruit of Jesus in our lives, of what we're becoming in our conduct, our holiness, our purity. And can I say that there are many of us who aren't even there, but we should be striving. Then, the other way, besides character, is in our ability to do the works that Jesus did. And this is where I want to trust God to totally undo us as a church. Because almost every bit of preaching we hear is about who we should be becoming. Relational integrity with each other and with God. But I want to say that's only one arm of the two arms required to become children of God. You already are one, but to walk into the fullness of. So the one is your character, the way God helps you, in the way that you deal with others, your person, who you're becoming. The other is the works that we do. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of works so that no one may boast. So Paul starts off by saying, listen, you became a child of God because something happened to you, not because of works. But then he carries on and he says, but you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So you are not the result of works, but you're for works. You need to get the, the concept going, which God has prepared in advance that we would walk in them. So there is this becoming a child of God where we not only emulate Jesus in our character and our nature, but we begin to emulate Jesus by doing what he did. And that's where I feel there's going to be an undoing and a messing up with us in this church. Because I believe God wants to bring us to the place where we walk in a greater level of anointing for the supernatural. John 14 verse 8, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I'm in the Father, the Father's in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Those words at the moment are busy shocking me to the core. Because do I believe I'm saved? 100%. Do I believe I can lose my salvation? No ways. Am I convinced that no matter what happens between now and the day I die, that I'm going to see Jesus Christ face to face and be welcomed in as a child of God? I am absolutely convinced. That truth of Scripture has become mine. It was the gift of the Reformation. Where Martin Luther battled with his works and sinfulness and he discovered in Romans, the righteous shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Hang on, I'm a Catholic priest. I'm fulfilling all of this. But the just shall live by faith. It was a standing statement of the Reformation. Something happened in people where they realized that if I just believe I'm saved, take your rules and shove them. I know I'm saved. And I'm saying what God wants to bring now is an understanding in the same way that I know that I know that I'm saved, that I know that I know that I'm full of the Holy Spirit, that I know that I know that I speak in tongues, I need to know that I know that the Spirit in me wants to do the works of Jesus. That's the gap that I feel God wants to fulfill in this next season. I prepared my sermon this afternoon. I'm going through it. I'm praying through it. And someone who's not in this church sends me a text just now. 
Not in our church at all. This, I'm going to read it for you word for word. Hey, Greg, don't know if this means anything to you or not. You know I often pray for you. I felt the other day that God wanted me to tell you, next level. And I got that at 16 minutes past four this afternoon. I believe God wants to take this church to a whole different level. Not two, three, four of us. A church. Willing to say, Lord, I will be so undone. But I will look at broken people. And even if I don't have an answer for them, even if I don't know how you can do it, I'm just going to pray that you do. I'm just going to trust you, Lord. I want to start caring, praying for, declaring over sick, broken people that you start doing creative miracles in front of us. Surely it's going to start happening. Do you know what it does for your Christian faith when you pray for someone and you walk away thinking, oh, whatever, and they start screaming because they did get healed? Huh? Do you know what it's like to be a basket case for Jesus? How many of you are there that just, you're just weirdos? I'm 18. I know everything. Just being saved, filled with the Spirit. When I pray, the tangible presence of God comes in the room. We go out to, uh, we go out to a place in Hillbrow called the Temple. This is the debauched place. God tells us to go. We've got a prayer group. Every Thursday night, we're going to pray together. Just pray and say, God, where do you want us? And he tells us, and we go there. This time, it was the temple in Hillbrow, One Oak Fields. We just go to the temple. All get in cars. We drive out there, and uh, we start praying outside the entrance. The bouncers are so that hang in with us. They tune us, flip, and push off. So we go to the corner now. There's the corner. They're still there. There's the door. We're here. And we're going for it. So we give money. It's a true story. Give some money to some oaks, and they go on the inside. They're going to go talk to them. I mean, who's ever tried to witness to oak in a, in a club? Give up. Just stop. We've done it. Go in there. And the oaks are like, huh? Huh? Because there was the noise and the hunting on and all the rest of it. And then it bounces, try to throw us out. So, we put our, so then they, they gas us. The tear gas. And now we are coughing and we're splattering and we, everything. But this is for Jesus. You've got to understand. <laughs> and we are in a total mess. And we, I, So one of the oaks comes up with this idea. Puts his hands on it and says, I curse this place. It will close. It will, it. And I'm thinking, whatever. <laughs> so we go home. Three weeks later, that place closed down. They found problems with its fire license and what, 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 what? Anyway, the place did close down. You start to say, whoa. Then, then we're going in, in the middle of winter. Commissioner Street, Rissick. We're handing out food to people who are homeless, clothesless, food blankets. And what happens is you arrive in this folksy bus. And the moment that that volley arrives, the homeless people know it's full of blankets. They don't want blankets. They want to sell the blankets for money. I'm not lying. I've been there when that thing went on two wheels. In the end, I mean, you're a follower of Jesus, but you're pushing them and you're fighting, <laughs> kicking them off the vehicle. I mean, it's crazy. And uh, the cops come around the corner with their dogs, dog patrol. And this one comes, and he is so out of it. Demons, are, he's blaspheming, and he's honing on. And I just feel the Holy Spirit says, rebuke this thing against the wall. So this oak's standing here, and I take him like this, and I shove him against the wall, and I tell him, in the name of Jesus, you, I bind you to that wall. This oak, I promise you, he stands against the wall and he can't move. He's, he's doing this. And it's like, it's like those hero movies. I am, whoa. This is, this is amazing. This is happening. Just crazy. Because Jesus says, do something. And he's there. And we gave food and blankets. And this oak's standing there going, I kept looking. It's working. And uh, shortly after, remember, I'm in church. If I'm lying, the Lord will hit me by now. And he's against the wall. And we say, okay, that's it. We're going to go now. The cops with their dogs come past the police dogs. Because if there's too much cars, they just let the dogs go. I'm talking 1989. Just let the dogs go. So the cops go around the corner. We finish what we're doing. And as we do, the Lord says, release him. I says, you're released in Jesus' name. He comes off the wall like this. And he says to me, what happened? And I said, he said, I said, well, explain. He says, I could not leave the wall. I said, my friend, it's the presence of God. What are I? I'm 18. I don't know what the Bible says. He says, well, I need this. Prayed for him. He was 
drunk as a newt. He was stone cold sober, saved and speaking in the spirit inside of about three minutes. You think, God, how? Could have missed an entire moment just going off. I'm just saying to you, I think God's going to start doing a few things. That's going to mess us up a little bit. And we need to be okay with it. And when we're going to pray and we're going to say, Lord, I long for more of you. You cannot be a religious bigot in this place today and ask for more and expect you're going to get it. But if I can, I'll say this. Number one, there will be no increase of the anointing of God without greater intimacy with him. It's a starting place. You've got to sow to the Spirit. You've got to have intimacy. Can you feel in our worship, in our preaching, in our home groups, in our, this, the language of the church at the moment is this deep intimacy, this growing intimacy with Jesus. Are you aware of it? It's coming through everywhere. Jesus said to his disciples, even to Philip, he said, Philip, the Father's in me. I'm in him. Intimacy. Out of intimacy, God's going to do the work through us. Philip, my father, is doing the work through me. It's not me, Philip. It's my father. It's you and I releasing ourselves to the place where we literally allow God to use us. Not in ones and twos, but in fifties, hundreds at a time. A church, a whole church saying, Lord, we're open, we're ready. I want to develop my intimacy with you. And I'm talking basics. I'm talking about some of you getting up earlier. Some of you don't know that it's dark in the morning. It is. The sun's not there. Some of you thought, what? no, what, what do you mean? The sun, I wake up, the sun's there. I go to bed, the sun's there. Surely the sun's 24 hours. No. No. It's not. It's not. So get up and discover this to be true. And go, some of you, and start spending uninterrupted time because it's not enough that I convince you once a week for 30 minutes. You need to be convinced by the Spirit. You need to undo you a little bit. Intimacy. Out of that intimacy, God's going to start whispering things to you. He's going to start telling you to do things. Are you okay for that? Are you okay to start listening in tiny ways? When Jesus says... Um, Go find a boy with two fish and five loaves. I want to feed a whole multitude here. Really? Yeah. Okay. You said so. How many of you are saying, I only have this much money? You ready with that word, John? How many of us have said, I've only got this much money? And the Lord says, but I want you to do this and I want you to do that with my money, not yours. And you've worked out your budget and he messes with it. And he says, no, do this for me. And watch how I bless you. How many of you have done? I've had people testifying to me. I do my maths, tithing, I can't come out at the end of the month. I tithe, I do everything, I give everything. End of the month comes, there's still some money. How? I don't know. God does it. If he can supernaturally heal your body, he can heal your wallet. Or not. Of course he can. He can do absolute wonders. 